show, Mr. Marawa. Are you starting already? Yes. <laughs> Jeez, you don't mess around. But I think it's good to chat on Novani over top seven. I'm joking. I'm joking. Let's let that one go. <laughs> don't, even, don't even mind that. So I had the great opportunity of reading um, your book. Your recently released oh. book, Tum Shalele. Wow. I was actually supposed to do the preview, but I think you were too busy uh, at the time, and there was too many people wanting to wanting to uh, yeah. review it. Okay. You know, and what I picked up there um, that was uh, a huge uh, theme was how you just emphasized how you had a really good upbringing. You know, you had no problem with your upbringing. Uh, your father made sure that you celebrated every milestone, wow. all your birthdays. You had cake and candles. Tell me a little bit more about uh, growing up in KZN to a businessman of a father, nurse and strong mother and two sisters. Yeah, um, before they kick my mm, it's three sisters. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, I'm number three. So Nom Vola Kuku, myself and yes. Vanessa. Um, yeah, so those are the three sisters that I've been surrounded by all my life. So you can imagine there's um, there are four ladies in the house, and then it's me and my dad. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's basic stuff. So the cake was always a treat because once in a while, you know, when he goes across to a fry head, which was like the closest, you know, place to get stuff for the little shop that we had in Makaya, then he would come back with a, a cake for whoever was having their birthday during the year. Mm. So we try to, I, I think that's where family values uh came through because mm. uh, I value family till today simply because of what was taught to me via my father and my mother because mm. in the end when my dad passed away in 2016 they had been married for 52 years mm. you know so that's uh, no child's play especially in today's uh, you know relationships that are lost as long as you know Willie's food which is you know best before <laughs> Saturday type of thing you know so I Going back to your question, mm. I, I really valued family mm. a lot. I, I really value family still now. And especially with my dad gone, it becomes our responsibility collectively to look after Uma, who's now 86, mm. and make sure that, you know, uh, her journey becomes and still continues to be a good one. Mm. Tell me something. How did Uma feel, I mean, in mm. her 80s, seeing South Africa and the world going through such a, a pandemic that we were not prepared for we were yeah. so unprepared and she was a nurse yeah uh, she worked in the health fraternity mm. uh, what were her words as she saw people dying the way that they were <sighs> yeah god i we try to protect her we try to shield her uh, we use whatever we could to bring the health workers to come through to the house because we didn't want her to leave home so they came through and g gave her the two vaccinations that we had to all take and we really cotton wool there. Mm. We try to make sure that Uma doesn't leave and get into a space where there are a lot of people or people come into the house because obviously she was very vulnerable mm. as an elderly person. Uh, but it so happened that I ended up being the one getting the COVID on two occasions, ending up again in ICU with the COVID. So I, I got to see the people mm. uh, leaving the world at a quicker rate because in ICU, it's as bright as it is here in the studio so one day you're seeing somebody who's there in the morning you're seeing the mattress is flipped over and you know that uh, it's game over so it, it was it was a frightening time for all of us because we, we did not know so any little uh, you know sneeze that she had would be like hey are you okay you mm, know mm. Uh, then we check her oxygen levels uh, we had all the equipment that was there we, we just try to make and manage the situation as much as we could but you know thank god Mm. Uh, she did not get COVID at all. Mm. Yeah. I also picked up in the book um, that uh, you learned a lot from your father. You looked up to him. Yeah. Um, how he showed you that family is important, mm. but also the fact that, uh, you know, he used to have fun. You guys used to have fun with your dad uh, oh. in terms of some of the events uh, that uh, were hosted with people showing off with the way that they were dressed. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, you read this book, didn't you? I did, I did read it. And wow. uh, the fact that, um, you know, he was a, a person who also loved Tiger Woods before Tiger Woods became Tiger Woods. Is he yeah. the one who motivated you somehow to start commentating sports? Yeah, he loved golf. I had no clue what golf was. I still don't. People try and get me to come and play golf. Me too. I, yeah, no, golf and I, it's a whole day's affair. Mm. Um, 
and I don't think I've got the opportunity to have five hours to, you know, quing and follow the ball and quing <laughs> again. You know, that's, you know, privileged people stuff. So he loved golf because he was a caddy. Mm. I mean, he's a Mutswana man from Klekstorp, um in the Northwest, in Jubitin. And he had a couple of Africana friends that also who played golf and he was caddy to them. Uh, but obviously, where are you going to play golf? Mm. So that was not a possibility. I did not have time to learn golf. I just knew that I wanted to do sport, but I wanted to follow football. So yeah. football was my passion. Football is what I followed on that radio that I spoke about in the book. And we listened to, and I felt like a hero. He has a small area on the radio, but the whole boarding school was around listening to the commentary at the time. Um, yeah, it was strange because he almost felt like he was probably Tiger Woods' father, you know, <laughs> because I think he was also just happy that there was a, a, a black face that was breaking into a golfing sphere, yeah. breaking into uh, a sphere that was always dominated by, you know, white people. Mm. Do people know that you had actually registered to study to become a lawyer? I studied law for three years. I was yes. like, my final year, I was like, I wanted to do law. But that things opened thing. up for you in the media. I made things to open up. You yes. know, I think sometimes when you say things open up, it's almost like, ah, somebody must somewhere call you, the button. just sort me out. You know, yes. Spanban, who's inside. And I, I knew no one. Mm. I, I just knew what I wanted to do and found ways and means to move from campus at Wits University yeah. uh, in between lectures to go for this, you know, very important audition mm. uh, that then started my journey. Although it was, hey, Simonia days, but it was getting inside that building yeah then after one year then getting to the department that i actually wanted to be a part of which was sport mm. um, so it took a bit of time but at the end of the day i was patient enough um, i just had to apologize to the 1820 settlers foundation that had already agreed with me and my yes. dad to go study uh, law in the uk you know so i was meant to go and do entertainment law mm. um, so now it's almost like i wasted a good three years was so I was like four or five half year courses away from graduating mm. uh, but I think the intensity of where I was with my broadcasting journey made it impossible for me to make a u-turn mm. and go back and study law and pursue I suppose academically what I thought was needed because hey Emma Kaya you're, you're a doctor you're a nurse you're a teacher what is broadcasting mm. you know uh, and usually people say, and even in, in deep into my career, people still ask me, uh, Rob, so besides uh, TV and radio, what else do you do? As if doing radio and TV is just like a little piecemeal job in here and on the side. People still think that, eh? They do. And that's, and that's the problem <laughs> of changing the mindset. And that, that became then part of my duty to say, please respect the industry enough to know that this can be your profession, this can be your job. Mm. If you invest enough in it, if your main aim is not to be popular and famous and try and be on the cover of magazines, then this can actually be your job. Otherwise, yeah, you'll be on the magazines, but next year, where are you gonna be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned something quite important that you said your dad uh, looked at uh, in terms of Tiger Woods and seeing yeah. the first black face in a sport or a sporting code that was mostly uh, for the white and the elite. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think the world is doing better right now in terms of that, uh, whether it be the actual athletes mm. and the, actu the, the presenters, people who are on your side of the job? Yeah. The world is where? Athletics, for example. Mm. Black people never had a problem in terms of expressing themselves. And you look at all the world records, they're mm. largely dominated by your your black athletes. You look at basketball in the main. Yes, it might not be as global as what football is, mm. uh, but still, you know, your top earners are from the basketball sector. Your top earners obviously come into the football sector. That's where you get diversity within. Mm. Um, so I would always say I'm I'm pretty proud of how the world turned out. You know, the only sticking point was always here at home yeah. with your crickets and your rugby's that were against a transformative uh, direction that we were all taking. So I think a large bulk of where I got into trouble within the SABC um, was making your ministers of sport who did not want to be questioned or criticized um, 
then we would fight the fight of our transformation. Mm. Uh, because if you are in the ministry and you're in government and leadership, yeah. then lead. Then whatever brought about inequality, let us see you turn it around so that people get an equal opportunity. That's that's actually uh, quite true. Looking at uh, some of the things that you've just said now, it's it's things that we still struggle with, where people yeah. who are supposed to be held accountable don't want to be held accountable. Yeah. And uh, it makes the jobs of people like you and I quite difficult because yeah. it's either they don't want to speak to us, they yeah. just decline, or if they do come through, they are victims. Always. <laughs> I see a lot of them who come onto your show. Um, they almost look like... Uh, well, so like, like well, what have I done? What do you mean? Yeah, <laughs> and then they talk as a collective, but you say no, but you there's an individual. So then you are the face of this yeah, department. You're the face of the department. So I always say that for me, the the biggest problem that we don't challenge enough is the electoral system. Yeah. We don't challenge enough that a party goes into Congress, Manga Wong or whatever they have a Congress. They with their branches choose a leader. Mm. And then they come back to the general populace and say, this is our leader. But this leader is the leader of the party. So you like this party, so you will vote for the party, but this is the leader we give you. Mm. And then within two years, they're fighting amongst themselves against the leader that they've given you. The leader must bring the hope and not a collective. Mm. Because now everybody who's there singing and dancing, they want the tail end of the benefit of that. Remember, this is not a, a struggle now to fight apartheid. When we hear our grandmothers and our aunties saying, hey, Mpanam, hey, Begum Nandi, man, under apartheid, we had it good. It's and that worries strange, you. strange, yeah. That's that strange. That worries you. And I just want to clarify to those who might be uh, listening to our chat and they think, mm. what's Robert talking about politics? I mean, the guy is a sports guy, etc." Besides the fact that you're mm. also a South African citizen that has a right to have an opinion yes. about these things, because you also form part of the same electorate, tell us about your family's history of uh, political affiliation. Mm. I know that your 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 maternal grandfather, for instance, yeah. was the the, uh, the uh, bishop at an Anglican church that worked with Chief Albert Lutuli. Yes. So maybe just for clarity, so that people don't <laughs> think you're just talking out of the whim. No, and people must talk out of the whim. I think sometimes <laughs> people think they own politics. Mm. Uh, you even find on social media and Twitter, people say, "Ah, Rob, why are you tormenting about uh, politics? Saying you must stick to what you know," and and you laugh inside and you say, "Nobody owns politics." The mm. fact that whoever goes and queues at the ballot box and votes indirectly, you're entitled to have an opinion because you make an opinion at the ballot box. So you have an opinion verbally. Yeah. So what stops anybody from doing that? And I think, again, uh, people based on uh, yeah, just trying to be, you know, big boss over everyone. There's nothing like that. Everybody has a voice when it comes to politics. Mm. You're right. My grandfather. Yes. Uh, bishop A.H. Zulu, Anthony Hamilton Zulu. He was the bishop of the Anglican Church. Mm. Uh, he started off at St. Fate's in Durban within that church. Became, you know, the bishop, uh, I think because of age. Mm. He was very close as well with uh, the late Archbishop Desmond Dutu. Yeah. Um, he would have been in that position, but I think just in terms of age, then he couldn't then, you know, Archbishop Desmond to do occupy that position. But he was a very wise man. I was very young, uh, but I think I always took great counsel from him, listened. Uh, he wasn't giving me lectures. I was just learning off him without him knowing that I'm actually silently picking up a lot of the things that he was, that he was saying. And when you have that wisdom, and mm -hmm. that is why he, when he retired even, uh, you know, Prince Mangosu Tumdona Pindangene then roped him in uh, to be the Speaker of the House in the KwaZulu uh, Legislative Assembly. Mm. So th he basically said, we can't waste that brain. We have to bring him closer. And, you know, politics, I think the first election, uh, you know, we, that was a very heavily IFP dominated territory, yeah. Fort Lewis and Gaindler. And we were part of the, you know, the IEC people that were making sure everyone does the right thing, uh, you know, channel them the right way, et cetera, et cetera. So we became involved in that. So I was not in the forefront of any movement. I was not in the forefront of any party. Uh, but I think politics is heavily entrenched because I take great pleasure in, in following whatever it is that is current affairs in South Africa and globally. Mm. And just knowing about politics in general, uh, because I, I, I don't think we have to have a passport to know 
about politics. And I think that is where those debates and arguments, and maybe that's why we, we shut down uh, so many fresh young ideas in South Africa, because we think if you haven't been through the so-called struggle, but I don't know anyone who was part of the struggle who's there now. Um, but <laughs> if, you, if, if you're not there, then you can't have a voice. Mm. How much pressure was it? I mean, besides the fact that it, it was actually, uh, you were actually fortunate to grow up in a household where your parents yeah. and your grandparents led in the community the way that they did. Yeah. But how much pressure was it in terms of making mistakes? You had a father who was a businessman, a mm. mom who was a nurse, mm. a grandfather who was a bishop of the Anglican Church. Mm. That's, a, you know, one of the biggest churches sure. in the world. Yeah. And he had affiliation to politics to open your mind and conscientize mm. you. So, you know, how much pressure was that in terms of, I cannot, I cannot make the, the wrong step? <laughs> I don't know. I never felt that way. I mm. just felt like I had, you know, I mean, my dad was strict. So we probably hardly had those serious, hard conversations. Mm. Uh, but there was always newspapers. And I think newspapers are what molded me as well. Because I'd always ask my mother to keep them for me when I was at school. So we, we never had gazillion holidays like schools do now where there's half term, end of term, what, what term, you know, we just went home four times a year. Yes. So in those four times, I came back to a pile of newspapers, obviously for the sports side, but obviously there's also the front side. Mm. So I ended up reading the entire newspaper and I, I would start to get interested in all sorts of issues that were in the publications. And they were very rare. I mean, Sowetan came like twice a week there, but still we grabbed it. City Press came through. So th that was my university. Uh, growing up in a farm were just those publications that came through. There was, there was nothing else to do. You couldn't mm. say, I'm going to the ice rink. We, no, you have no ice rink there. You know, everything was what you did on the farm, making sure that things are, you know, whether they're growing in the vegetable garden or they're being looked after in terms of, you know, cattle, sheep and so on. Mm. Uh, so that was the basic foundation. Everything else you had to do yeah. it yourself. Yeah. yeah. So. Yes, supposed to be rattling it, but born bread and butter in case it is. Yes. Yeah. So how is it, uh, you know, when did you eventually find out that actually Robert Marawa is Zwana, not Zulu? No, I knew when did you we, realize it? We went, we would go to Claxton. Yeah. It was like a forever drive though mm. from where we stayed. It's far. Yeah. But uh, we would go and I would be fascinated. It was obviously in case that it's just like one language if you look yes. at it. Uh, unlike Joburg, which is really multicultural. Even the Zulu, there's different Zulus in Joburg. No, there, there is, yo. <laughs> in a big way, they all think that they are Zulu, which is fine. <laughs> it's a universal language, mm. you know. So so when we go to Jubatin and Blackstop, um, then you'd pick up, man, with no. There's language that's being spoken that uh, is not registering, you yeah. know. Um, but it took time because when you go back home, then besides your father who's working for the longest time and then you're going to boarding school, there's not much time to actually learn the language. Because once you know, then who are going to speak the language too? Mm. You know, so it, it, it became a problem up until I got to university. Mm. Um, but, but did he speak to you in this Zulu? Yeah, no, he knew Zulu. But mm. he married Mazulu, Mgabezi, uh, Tumakeb. So he had to, even just for his own survival, because yes. before getting into the industry, we, you know, you'd be stopped by traffic cops and they look at your... ID and your driver and say, eh, Marawa, in, in my mm. you know, and the thing is, you know, they, hey, they don't mess around, they're very like, boom, there's mm. no, there's no softening, there's not like who or what, it's like, in my yeah, yeah, <laughs> so learning wasn't making sense to mm. a lot of the guys, but uh, no, in essence, you know, the family values, like I say, would then transcend to the other side and uh, you know, mm. co visitation at times, yeah, with one over the other, mm. yeah. So, recently, we lost someone who was a hero in many people's eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, our very first time in South Africa, only time actually, mm -hmm. that we won CAF, yeah. And, uh, you know, where were you when, when you find out when you found out about that Dick Clive Barker? How, how, like, what was your reaction? Oh. Yeah, no, Clive was probably one of the, like, one of the top, top people that I knew who supported my journey. Mm. Uh, three years ago, he granted me an interview, one-on-one, -on -one, as we're having in Durban. 
Uh, he had finished writing his book. Uh, but even then, I could tell that there were just a few elements that were not Clive-like. Uh, just recollection, memory-wise, the kind of speech that he was able to have at the time. So it wasn't Clive, you know, the dogged character, mm. but I'm confident. I could tell, although I did not know the diagnosis at the time, what it was, but you could see it. But he was still very pleasant. The stories he told are very honest, reflective. He was saying when he should have, he shouldn't have resigned. He let his players down. Retrospectively, he thinks it was a bad thing. So when somebody is accountable like that, and you say, wow, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to still face somebody who takes full accountability yeah. for him resigning at a time that he feels that he should not have resigned, that he should have been with his players. Um, so when the news came through, in fact, yeah, my 86-year-old mother is the mm. one who posted in the family group about it. And I was like, wow, mm. oh, okay. And you know when you have a, a thing during the week where you say, I need to phone John, John's the son, um, just to find out how is Clive doing? Because we hadn't spoken for about two months after Clive had been released from hospital. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I suppose events uh, overtook. You know, Clive sadly passed away. Yeah. The family, I do feel for them. Mm. Um, you know, Gavin, John, uh, his wife, Yvonne, um, they all mean something to South Africans in a, in a big, big way. And, you know, may his soul rest in peace. Mm. Somebody was saying, I mean, not even one road is named after him, or at least yeah. even if it's a small statue at Safa House. You know, um, you know, just to represent a coach that actually gave us the, that that gave us that very important <laughs> cup, and yeah, it's the only yeah. one we had since 1996. I'm telling you, <laughs> here we are, so many years down the line. But one thing I can tell you, free of charge, mm. Asak, was that we don't celebrate much in this country. Yeah. Um, America, any major athlete or musician that you think about, or comedian, NAACP would have recognized them and said, we have honored a Sidney Poitier. So by the time he passes away, we've done everything. We have honored a Michael Jordan. We've honored a Richard Pryor. We've honored a Smokey Robinson. Have had a full-on event at a, you know, in a, in a place like an ICC mm. or Santa Convention Center or anywhere of that nature and have it shown on national television to mm. say we honor so-and-so today. We don't do that. We're not an honoring country. You know, it's the other part that's sad for me, that uh, a footballer, a former footballer yeah. such as Lucas Khadebe, is celebrated more in... Yeah. When he goes to Leeds, people lose their minds. Yeah. People, I mean, I was honored to be at his testimonial. You know, if you've been at a club for 10 years or more, it is a standard, like an unwritten rule in football, that you have a testimonial game. Mm. They don't do that in South Africa. They did it for Lucas at Ellen Road, for Leeds United. They are like, I don't know, paintings and all sorts of things yes. all over Leeds. He has a suite at Ellen Road named after him. You know, there's a bus named after him. There's a beer called Rada Beer mm. that is named after him. That is just how much so the British. He means. We'll celebrate our own guy. They will. And They'll we celebrate won't. everybody else. Yeah. They will. We have to wait for Jomo Sono to pass away, and then we say, oh, no, mm. what are we going to do? Hey, hey. But it's too late. Honor the people while they're still alive, which is part of my journey that I've tried to do on my Friday shows, is really to say to people, well, they can breathe, and we can give them their flowers while they can smell them, to say, thank you. Yeah. You did great, mm. you know. So with everything that you and I have spoken about, without the viewer thinking that we're despondent, we obviously are raising very critical issues in our yeah. country that need to be looked at and fixed. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you worry about your children? I do. I've only got a son, mm, you know. Mm. But I mean, you know, like you, know African, a, you know, in the African the culture, village. your children can also be your sister's kids. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. No, I get, I get your point fully. And I'm just saying that, just having one kid, you always think, hmm, what are the chances like my parents did with it, four of us? Yeah. And during that time. During that time, which we, you know, for them was difficult, but they did not know that post apartheid life will be more difficult. That just having lights on, uh, just having water to drink. And we at some point had the cleanest water, I think, in the continent or even parts of the world. And 
Yeah, I do worry about them because I don't know what opportunities uh, there will be. You know, the rate on the, of unemployment is so staggering. Uh, you know, porous borders, crime and criminality that never gets accounted for. Uh, even if you can capture somebody on CCTV, we just watch. So there's just a lot of governance issues that need to be sorted out. I just think that South Africa exists mainly because of the will of the people that want it to work mm. at the moment, but not the people elected that have said they want to lead us somewhere. So if you get elected, then show your leadership. Don't wait for us or don't wait for a pandemic to address the country. We have a daily pandemic in crime, water, no electricity, all sorts of things. And like, show us, you know, we don't have to wait for State of the Nation address to mm. deal with issues. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for speaking to me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was <laughs> Such hoping we'd honor. laugh just a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> we can always laugh, man. We can always laugh. We'll have one for National Comedic Day. Yes. Yes. <laughs>